Excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to who is with us on WebEx and to who is now watching this uh, video. The Geneva Environment Network uh, has the pleasure to welcome you today virtually for a special Wednesday for the planet held in the run up to World Wildlife Day, which is officially celebrated next week. Today, we are discussing and presenting the documentary Killing the Shepherd by um, Tom Ope who we are delighted to welcome virtually to Geneva. We have also with us Ivan Iguero, the Secretary General of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, known as, as CITES, as well as two leading experts, Maxi Lewis, the Director of NASCO, and Maxi will tell us what NASCO is later, as well as Adam Hart, a scientist, author, and broadcaster from the University of uh, Gloucestershire. You can hear from my voice that I am not an English native. We have a chat uh, function and Q&A as we are streaming uh, the, um, and we are also streaming this event. Um, we could eventually bring some of you uh, to the stage uh, during uh, the discussion. So let's see how this uh, runs, but don't hesitate to bring your questions in the Q&A for who is uh, with us on WebEx and in the, um, in the comments for who is with us on social networks. So let's start the discussion and it's my pleasure to turn to um, uh, the Secretary General of the Convention um, on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and, Fa and Flora to deliver welcome remarks as this, this, this screening today and discussion uh, is organized within the framework of the World Wildlife Day. Uh, with that, over to you, Ivan. Thank you so much, Diana, and thanks for the warm welcome. Let me thank the Geneva Environment Network for organizing this, this event and the invitation to speak. Really grateful that you're celebrating, helping us celebrate World Wildlife Day with this discussion. Thanks to all of you for joining us today to discuss the film Killing the Shepherd, which I hope you have all had a chance to watch. The film addresses many of the issues we work on at CITES. Wildlife conservation in a poor country such as Zambia poses a particular set of challenges and the film provides plenty of food for thought about how to address those challenges. Congratulations and thanks to the film director who's here with us today, Tom Opry, for this exclusive screening. The alarming decline of wildlife around the world has many causes. Land conversion and habitat destruction are particularly important drivers of wildlife loss. When an ecosystem is converted to farmland or when it is cleared of timber or other plant resources, or when climate change affects rainfall and temperature, and alters the mix of plant life, most of the wild animals living there will either die or leave. Habitat loss is a complex issue that is strongly linked to human population and economic trends. Another major driver illustrated by this film is poaching. This is a serious concern for Africa's big five, elephants, rhinos, lions, leopards, and buffaloes, but also for many other species in many other parts of the world. As the film explains, there are two kinds of poachers, each one with different motivations. Community poachers are local people driven by poverty to take bushmeat or to obtain wild animals or products for personal use or for income. Commercial po poachers, on the other hand, are often heavily armed people coming from outside the community. They have links to illegal international trade and are motivated solely by money. Because of the link, to illegal international trade, poaching is a major concern at CITES. Unfortunately, people living with wildlife may often see no benefit from the survival of the wild animals around them, many of which can be quite dangerous if they lack access to good health, to food, education and jobs, they can be driven by poverty to exploit wildlife in a way that undermines the species survival. The story told in this film about how Makasa Safaris engages the local community by creating jobs in the safari industry, while also supporting other development activities, describes one conservation approach that has been recognized as effective. While strict protection can be the best approach to ensuring the survival of wildlife in many cases, in other situations, the sustainable use of wildlife can be a more effective option. CITES parties may consider sustainable consumptive and non-consumptive wildlife use approaches in line with the convention regulations to best conserve their wildlife. For your information, many of you may know already that in 2016, for example, 
CITES parties unanimously adopted a resolution that acknowledged the benefits of well-managed trophy hunting and trade in hunting trophies. The film also speaks to the theme of this year's World Wildlife Day, which we will celebrate on Thursday, 3 March. Because the fates of individual species and entire ecosystems are intimately linked, we are focusing this year on how we can protect keystone species, species that play a particularly vital part in shaping how their ecosystem functions, including apex predators such as lions and their contributions to ecosystem health. The theme of recovering key species for ecosystem restoration contributes fully to the ambitions of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, which runs from 2021 to 2030. I take this opportunity to invite you to join us for our World Wildlife Day celebration on Thursday, 3 March at 2 p.m. Central European time. The event will feature some high-level presenters and six diverse stories from people running projects in the field. The link to the YouTube channel where you can watch the proceedings is posted on our website at wildlifeday.org. It promises to be both an educational and enjoyable few hours. We all have a role to play in wildlife conservation and ecosystem restoration. At CITES, governments set the rules for international trade in wildlife. These rules also affect the hunting, harvesting, and collecting of specimens that leads to trade. CITES uses a rigorous system of trade permits to ensure that trade in at-risk species is sustainable. When a plant or animal species is threatened by extinction, CITES often goes further and bans all commercial trade in that species. CITES decisions are science-based and pragmatic. I have another engagement shortly and may have to leave the discussion, but I'm really looking forward to hearing it. I have my colleague Sophie online as a presenter in case there's any questions at the end that I'm not here to answer. Of course, again, thanks to the Geneva Environment Network, you, the listeners, and Tom Opry, Adam Hart, and Maxi Lewis for engaging with us on this important issue. Thanks, Diana. So I was thanking uh, the Secretary General of uh, CITES for her excellent introduction to this event. And let's now turn to the, uh, the film director, Tom Op, who has joined us. Uh, Tom um, uh, is a cinematographer, also a television producer and a wildlife uh, conservationist who has made uh, educating uh, the public uh, on wildlife conservation and uh, stewardship issues a main priority. Tom currently serves as the executive director of the Shepherds of Wildlife Society uh, that have been partnering with us uh, to offer you this uh, session uh, today. So Tom, you are the director and writer of uh, the film uh, we are presenting today. Um, we would like to hear about your motivations uh, to produce this film. Uh, and if you could also briefly present uh, Shepherds uh, of Wildlife Society, that would be also interesting for the the, the who is uh, with us uh, uh, online today. Tom, over to yeah. you. Diane, thank you very much. And thank you, Secretary General and, and all of CITES and all the people that are out there. And, and obviously, uh, Maxie and, and Adam for participating in this very crucial and critical um, conversation about the realities on the ground when it comes to wildlife conservation and specifically today in Africa. And uh, uh, this film is, is, uh, is something that uh, I basically fell in my lap in 2016. I was doing a presentation at a wildlife conference in the East Coast of the United States. And uh, afterwards, a gentleman named Roland Norton came up to me. Uh, Roland at the time uh, was the uh, head of the chairman of the Professional Hunting and Guides Association of Zambia. And he came up to explain to me this uh, story about a, a woman chief that had knocked on the door of his import export business, which was his main uh, business. And uh, uh, asking him for help. Uh, her people were starving. They had uh, pretty well depleted or destroyed their wildlife resources, which uh, at one time where these folks live in a, what we call a uh, hunting concession area or what they call in Zambia, a, um, wild, or a GMA game management area, um, you know, due to poaching as the secretary general mentioned earlier, uh, it, it literally obliterated the wildlife populations to the point where certain species were locally extinct. And so uh, the story was sounded fantastic. I wasn't sure it was real. 
And uh, so I ended up going down in early 2017 after the rainy season uh, with a still photographer, uh, Tony Bynum. And we spent a couple of weeks just trying to determine if there really was a story here. And uh, when we finished up that time period, of, you know, albeit we didn't see very many animals, but we saw a lot of people that uh, were definitely desperate to struggle uh, and survive in life. But uh, they were sitting in one of the most beautiful habitats in the world, especially in Africa there in the lower Luano Valley. And so uh, over the course of the next uh, three and a half years, I think I spent close to 120 days on the ground in country, uh, documenting the things that I experienced and saw firsthand. Uh, and the idea there was to, you know, give this information, to, to give this rural indigenous community a, a voice because so many people in these areas don't have a voice. And, and we live now in uh, the, these, uh, our Western modern world, the communications age where people can be on social media and they can see a picture of something. Uh, you can post it now in a nanosecond. It can be seen anywhere in the world. And so uh, there's a lot of information out there and not necessarily a lot of the information is, is uh, correct or is the information really truly show showcase what the realities are on the ground, especially when it comes to wildlife conservation. So um, part of the reason why we started the Shepherds of Wildlife Society and its core is made up of wildlife photographers and outdoor filmmakers. We're out in nature, we're documenting it every day, and we see man's impact on the world, especially wildlife habitat. And it's not a pretty, it's not a pretty scene. And so we've all gotten together and, and organized our, our skills and content, and we're trying to put together uh, informative campaigns where we can educate the broader public, the people that really are, are disconnected from nature. Uh, and so our goal there is, is to reconnect them with nature so that they start to understand some of these stories and the realities on the ground instead of some soundbite they get on Facebook or social media that uh, may or may not be correct in what the realities are. And, and really what we've come to decide and understand is that most of our wildlife lives uh, obviously in rural parts of our world. And these folks uh, that live in those areas, these rural indigenous communities, um, they have to see a benefit. And if they don't see a benefit for those wildlife resources being there, whether putting up with the elephants uh, raiding their crops or having the, the baboons come in and eat, uh, you know, if they don't see some sort of economic benefit, uh, then you know, these things will go the way of the dodo bird. Uh, these, these animals and these habitats will, will be raised and, and they'll be gone forever. So that's what we, we want to make a change and we want to basically educate as many people as possible about why we're doing what we're doing. In, indeed, and, and as it has been mentioned, the film's address, uh, we are now screening it uh, in the framework of World Wildlife Day, but it addresses many topics that are uh, of interest for other discussions ongoing in International Geneva and uh, many uh, of the sustainable development goals that we are trying to uh, to achieve. Um, to, um, to discuss uh, further this film um, today, you have suggested that we invite uh, uh, two other leading experts um, and maybe you you could just say a few words why you suggested us to have uh, both uh, Maxi and Adam that we are going to introduce very soon. Yeah, you know, Maxi, uh, Maxi and I have communicated via WhatsApp and, and uh, different groups on, online, and, and I've been really impressed with the work that uh, her organization does in Namibia with their communities. And, uh, and, and luckily, we have great people like Maxi in, in Southern Africa that are, are really taking uh, the, the, the forefront and leading the charge to, to let other people know what the realities are for them uh, so that they can uh, take care of these wildlife resources. And so it's, uh, it's been a, a awesome that we have her here um, and uh, appreciate Maxi coming. Adam, uh, again, uh, someone else who I've, I've never met in person, but uh, had lots of communications with, and Adam is... Uh, uh, I've really enjoyed the conversations we have about the issues as he sees them and his trips to Africa uh, and his point of view coming from Europe and the UK. Uh, you know, here in the United States, things are very, very different for us in our wildlife conservation models here. Uh, so it's nice to be able to hear the perspectives. And so uh, I think Adam brings a, a great point of view. And in the fact that he also has a great platform as a BBC presenter uh, on radio, I think uh, that lends a lot of credibility to what he has to say. Um, and so it's been a pleasure to work with him over the last year.
Thank you very much. So let's move to uh, our two other guests. And we also understood from the informal discussions we had as we were just preparing this event that both Maxim and Adam uh, have uh, relationships with the colleagues at the, the CITES uh, Secretariat. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Maxi Lewis, uh, who is the director of the Namibian Association of uh, CBNRM support organizations, NASCO, DAXO. And um, Maxi will soon explain us uh, uh, what uh, this organization does. Maxi has a strong background in tourism and conservation. Uh, she co-founded uh, uh, more than uh, 20 years ago the Namibia Community-Based Tourism Association. And I, I, I have read, uh, Maxi, that you create linkages with, linkages with partners and decision makers, uh, including uh, parliamentarians, government ministries and other stakeholders. That's a little bit what we do here in Geneva, the Geneva Environment Network uh, with the International Geneva. And that you, I, we also um, uh, read that uh, Maxi's your motto is to leave a legacy where people uh, sustainably manage uh, resources and where women make a bigger contribution in the conservation industry. And we see also that the film uh, is about this. So maybe you could start by telling us what uh, NASCO is. Um, and then we can move on with the discussion. Over to you, Maxi. Um, thank you so much, Alice. And thank you so much, Tom, for, uh, for inviting me to be part of this significant uh, you know, um, for me, it's very historical, Tom, because we have been trying to get the voices of the communities out there. And I think we connected when you talked about your film. And I thought this was an opportunity for those who cannot be here uh, through the industry. And so thank you so much. But also thank you so much for the Geneva Environment Network for allowing us uh, this platform on this important day. I think uh, when you look at uh, the issue of Wildlife Day, our communities, um, especially the indigenous communities and the local people play a very important role. I think Tom said it in terms of where this wildlife is and they manage this wildlife, but sometimes there's a lot of challenge. So let me start by saying that, yes, my name is Maxi Lewis and I work for a network organization called NAXO. NAXO is a group of NGOs that supports um, uh, conservation activities in what we call um, communal areas in Namibia. And so we have been doing this over uh, probably more than 20, 27 years. And there has been quite a lot of successes with these communities. Also, when you link it to the film that Tom is, has shown, a lot of a lot of the work that we do um, actually is being depicted where we were coming from and what are some of the successes that came from the work that we do. We are so proud as a nation that because of the work that we do, we have seen um, a lot of uh, benefits coming from it, whether it's ecological benefits, whether it's uh, communities benefiting from wildlife or other natural resources. I think that is something that is very key um, in the work um, that, that, that we do. So uh, for us, um, it's not just about um, benefits, but it's also making sure that we are contributing towards the habitat for this wildlife. Um, and. Uh, Another thing that I also need to highlight is that on um, the, this Wildlife Day is that we have to be very proud and I want to congratulate one of our communities on the Northwest Escarpment that have uh, managed to save the black rhino um, that was nearly extinct and making a contribution towards the black rhinos. I think this day they need to celebrate and I'm honored uh, to share that uh, they are and they should be very proud to be part of this day today. So, Alice, I think this is where I'm coming from in terms of uh, um, uh, supporting communities, um, being very passionate about that, but also making sure that um, our communities have a voice. And this film, uh, for me, is just one of those opportunities that has been given for those that don't have voices to be heard. Thank you, uh, Maxi. Um... I had a few questions for you. You come from a neighboring country to, to Zambia, from Namibia. So if in your country, the tourism sector is, uh, uh, of course, an important sector contributing to the economy. And um, uh, what is in view, I mean, you, 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 the importance of uh, conservation and topics addressed in the film tourism in relation to, to the uh, yeah, the, 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 the tourism contribution to the, to the economy? 
Mm. And then maybe, so, you'll, yeah, yeah, please go ahead and then I will so, follow up. Okay. So, um, yes, we are a neighbor to, to Zambia um, and, um, but we also have different land uses as neighbors. Um, I think we are very fortunate as Namibia that we, in that uh, part of the world, we neighbor, we are neighbors to five countries and Zambia is one of them, but a very important uh, neighbor because uh, we share a big program um, of where five countries meet and Kaza is one of the biggest landscapes that we have created in managing uh, wildlife uh, crossing borders in, 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 in these countries. So um, we, we in, in terms of tourism, that landscape is also very important because you don't have to, you know, you, you, you fly on this important landscape and you can travel between all these countries. Obviously not as easy going into, uh, into Angola, but um, as you know, wildlife has no borders uh, for them. They just move. And this is why it's important for us to have managed and trying to manage this landscape as a big wildlife uh, uh, landscape. So um, what well, there's a lot of learning experiences between us and Zambia. Um, we have communities that come and, and, and learn from us and we also learn from the Zambian side and learn from all our neighbors, whether it's Botswana, uh, Zimbabwe or any other of those countries that are part of what we call the Casa landscape. So that is, it, it is very important. Yes, uh, we do have uh, Namibia. Um, we, we depend on tourism uh, up to 2019 um, before um, COVID, um, a lot of income, and I'm going to refer here to our rural landscapes, contributed a lot to our conservation work that we are doing, and also contributed a lot in terms of the benefits that are going to communities. And because of those income, communities have over the years, um, they have aligned themselves to protect wildlife, aligned themselves to uh, look after those resources. I can also tell you now, three or four years now into COVID, those landscapes are still being kept open by these communities. Why? Because over the years they have seen what uh, tourism contribution can do in terms of them maintaining open the, some of these landscapes. And part of those landscapes are conservation hunting that form part of those uh, landscape, landscapes, actually large landscapes at, at the moment that we need to, to, to keep open for these communities to be able to, to look after those habitats. So yes, tourism, both uh, consumptive and non-consumptive has made a big contribution um, towards what the work that you are doing. And we hope, and I'm very optimistic that things will become normal so that we can um, you know, get back to our normality for these communities to continue looking after these habitats otherwise uh, we will continue having challenges and we do have challenges in these landscapes, you know, human wildlife conflict. I think the Secretary General just mentioned it is one of our biggest challenges, but also habitat loss being one of our biggest challenges. And these are the things that we need to address. And on this day, I think we need to start prioritizing some of these issues. Thank you so much, Alice. Thank you very much, uh, Maxi. Let's move for our next uh, guest, Adam Hart, um, who is a scientist, author, and broadcaster, and he currently works at the University of uh, Gloucester, Gloucestershire. Sorry, um, Adam, you, you are uh, you have presented various BBC TV documentaries, um, and you have a strong interest in African conservation, and you have indeed written um, a number of high-profile articles on related issues including on uh, trophy hunting, uh, reno poaching uh, uh, and horn uh, legalization um, debate, um, the issues of fences in conservation, uh, misinformation in African conservation and the economics and conservation issues. Conservation is a very complex topic um, and each uh, stakeholder has its own uh, interests. Uh, the case of African conservation, particularly on the charismatic species is an example of this. Uh, how did you become interested in these issues? Uh, uh, and why is your background so wide, uh, varying from bacteria and social insects to the economic of uh, conservation? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yes, I'm back. My, uh, my computer had to restart, so I just about made it back in the nick of time. Um, yeah, I guess <clears throat> my, my background really is, is ecology and diversity. So I'm really interested in the interactions that occur 
um, across all sorts of levels. So although, you know, my, my PhD, for example, was on um, social insects, but what, really what I was interested in is how social insects interact within their environment and so on. So around about 2001, I was just coming to the end of my PhD and I took a, a trip to Africa. Um, I'd always been interested in African wildlife and things and, and wildlife in general. And I went to Malawi and I was I was very, very surprised at what I saw because it it wasn't what I thought it was going to be at all. Um, you know, bearing in mind, I just come out of a, a three year undergraduate degree looking at these issues, a three year PhD where I was involved in all kinds of bits and pieces. I, you know, I was quite surprised to, to land in Malawi and not sort of see wildlife everywhere. Um, actually, what I saw at the time was an awful lot of funerals. Um, Malawi was being very badly hit by the AIDS epidemic at that point. And I saw and smelt an awful lot of charcoal burning. Um, there were very, very few trees standing anywhere. Um, didn't really see any wildlife bigger than locusts and, and mice during that period. Um, spent a lot of time snorkeling in Lake Malawi and saw um, some of the overfishing issues there and so on. So by the time I left Malawi, I was in a little bit of a downer for, for, for sort of um, wildlife and so on. And then we, we drove through into Zambia and I can remember you know, it was a long drive and it took us a while to get through and, and so on. And I was just looking you know, out of the vehicle, constantly trying to find something to look at. And, you know, I saw lots of goats and cattle and, and people and, you know, a few kind of common species of birds. But again, it wasn't really what I was what I was imagining. Right. Uh, and then we went to a property in Zambia, which was um, actually owned by a friend of mine's family. And almost going through the gates, it was suddenly like sort of entering into kind of what I imagined Africa to be like before I'd actually been there. You know, it was uh, it was this sort of uh, landscape that was absolutely full of, of, of animals. There were impala running around and roan, which they were, um, which they had a lumber of there. We had sable going there. There was zebra, giraffe, you know, everything that you would expect to see really, apart from sort of elephants and lions and so on. And I was talking to the people that ran it and I sort of said, you know, how come when we come through here, there's all this wildlife, but we've seen nothing somewhere else. And, you know, bear in mind, I had just come out of, of, of a fairly lengthy period of education looking at these issues. This was the first time I'd come across the idea of sustainable utilization and, and the, the notion of hunting. And, you know, they explained very patiently to me that the reason why I could see wildlife in this land was because although they referred to it as the farm, actually most of what they they had there in terms of their livestock were, were wild animals and you know i kind of figured okay and then it was about a day later that i suddenly thought hang on a minute how does that make any money you know because i'm not paying to be here there's a couple of chalets and stuff but then this isn't a big tourist operation and that's when he said well we have hunters that come and and they hunt and and you know i can remember feeling at the time that this was a yeah, it was a pretty big kick in the guts, really, because it, it never occurred to me that this sort of thing still went on. And I didn't really understand it. And they were very patient over the next couple of days and explaining how it worked. And I was looking through, you know, various books of sort of records and all of this sort of stuff, some of which seemed OK and some of which I was pretty sketchy about, you know, how to measure porcupines and things. It all seems pretty, uh, pretty alien to me. But but slowly but surely, I kind of came to realize that the reason why I was looking at wildlife on this land and hadn't seen it anywhere else was that nowhere else did it have any value. And therefore it wasn't being protected and on this particular piece of land it did and actually their land butted onto other bits of land and and eventually actually into um national parks and so on and they, they formed part of a buffer zone around the outside of it so i left that trip with a, a sort of eye opener really in terms of, of the realities on the ground as, as what happens to wildlife and habitat when it doesn't have value um and then over the course of i guess the last two decades we've really, spent a lot more time particularly in, in southern africa and in, in south africa i was down in namibia recently um, having a chat with maxi and stuff and really starting to see how this kind of pieces together but you know I, I, a lot of people have issues with with trophy hunting and, and you know i would say to them that so, <laughs> so did i when, when i first came across this as a, a land use i was pretty agog but yeah it's uh, yeah, it's it's a much more complex situation than than many of us think, and and that, that many people are exposed to in in terms of media. Very good. Um, maybe we could have a, a few thoughts also uh, from you on the film itself, and what Tom tried to capture the, with that community. And the film touches on 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 many different topics, as we have already mentioned. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. So the way I look at the film is kind of similar to a chat I had. Uh, so I went down to see Maxi recently and, and we spent three or four days traveling around. And and during that period, we were we were talking a lot about conservation. And it was really actually mostly what we talked about. But 
what we talked about was actually um, economic growth and wealth. We talked about inequity of wealth. We talked about land use. We talked about politics, economics. We talked about empowerment of women. We talked about the structure of societies. We talked about language. We talked about tribes. We talked about geography. We talked a little bit about habitat. We talked about transport. We talked about apartheid. We talked about almost everything you can think of. One thing that we didn't talk about that much, wildlife. Because actually, when it comes to conservation, it's all the other issues that, that are really what it's about. And if you get that right, then then the wildlife follows. And I, and I think that's really my, you know, why I like this film is that it, it puts that forward very powerfully and very strongly in a way that I don't think we see very often, if at all, actually. Um, it explores issues that are genuine issues that affect conservation goals on the ground, things like child brides alcoholism, lack of opportunity, lack of basic food, lack of medical supplies and so on. And it, and it talks about practically how you can change those things. But I think what it also highlights is the difficulties that are there, you know, social difficulties as well, but practical logistic difficulties. You want to you want to build a fish farm? Well, that's a brilliant thing to do. And it's working very well for some of the people down there. But that is not a small undertaking to get set up. Um, and then you've got loads of fish. That's brilliant. But where are you going to sell them? And suddenly, in order to tackle a conservation challenge which is uh, illegal offtake poaching unsustainable offtake of wildlife you suddenly have to think about running small businesses and and how to get food into into marketplaces and so on and, and building up suppliers and and that's not something that you would expect you, you're talking about entrepreneurship and, and all of those sorts of things and I, and I think for me that's really what tom's film brings out it brings out just how complicated the sort of landscape and ecosystem of conservation is and, and how focused on people it has to be if we want solutions that work rather than solutions that that make us feel better when we're thousands of miles away. We have already a few comments here, but before we, we start addressing them, I, I have a, a last question for you, Adam. You you have published several papers that include studies on the issues like trophy hunting, um, and according to your research, one of the main threats uh, to conservation is misinformation, um, and as med and, and because it, it's also one of the topics touched into the film, as media coverage can often uh, have a, a an overly simplistic narrative on on trophy hunting. Um, what would you be your main recommendation to acknowledge the complexity of this issue from a media uh, point of view? I think really what the media need to do is is to stop being quite so lazy um, in terms of these sorts of issues. It's it seems like a very straightforward win. And if someone's telling you, particularly organizations that you may respect and, and, and trust are telling you, for example, that trophy hunting is endangering species and that only three percent of income goes back to communities, you're going to believe it. And I see those are the two biggest things that you see. Um, being put about now, even a cursory look at the red list reveals that actually the biggest threats to species of habitat loss and and poaching illegal bushmeat um, trading and so on um, I've recently done a, an analysis which we're going to be publishing where we look at the top 40 hunted species and and trophy hunting isn't an issue for any of them really except in a in in some limited case for lions and leopards actually the far bigger issues are habitat loss and and, and off tank so that's the first thing I mean the second thing is this this kind of myth that none of this money goes back to communities it, um, I see this repeated endlessly and and it's simply not true and it's actually a misreading of a report that itself was misreading a paper the author of which felt moved enough to write a piece that, that outlines why this is a myth um, but it's a very easy statement for the media to cling on to right because here's a charismatic animal with some you know fat idiot leering over it with a rifle and and those sorts of images you know i find as, as offensive often as anyone but you know, it's a very easy story. You've got a villain, you've got a charismatic animal being killed. Killing animals is obviously bad for populations, so right? clearly there's one fewer of that species around. So it makes sense, doesn't it, if you don't think of it too deeply, that it's a huge threat to all of these species. Words like endangered are thrown around very loosely anyway. Um, they have a distinct definition, which is usually overlooked. And then if you add into that the fact that, well, all these organizations that claim to help are actually lying and they're taking 97% of the money and are running away with it, then it makes a very, very easy story. But it doesn't take, I mean, it takes almost nothing to scratch the surface of that to reveal just how incorrect that that framing is. And I think that's really what the media perhaps need to do. And we see we see some journalists and some outlets attempting to, to look at this in a deeper way. But But yeah, I mean, the fear of many is that now we live in an increasingly populist political um, age 
Um, we are seeing politicians being swayed by very simple media narratives that are simple vote winners. And if you don't know very much about it, you're like me in 2001, suddenly being exposed to this stuff and feeling abhorrent about the whole thing. Absolutely, I completely understand where people come from. You know, I was there, um, but unfortunately the problems, you know, the problems of the world are usually complex and complex problems very rarely have simple solutions. So I think that's my, you know, my, my hope is that the media might start exploring this a little bit more and, and looking towards things in a more complex way. Thank you. Um, so let's address some of the comments that we have received. I don't know if Tom or Maxi, you want to add something at this stage? Otherwise, I can bring up here a comment that was made in the chat. Yeah, you know, uh, Diana, I, I definitely would like to kind of hit upon what uh, Adam is talking about. I, I think Bill, there's this huge disconnect in our modern Western world. And in one of those disconnects is kind of like what Adam was alluding to. You see this person shoot this animal and, and obviously sitting there doing the, the gloating of, uh, of this accomplishment in this person. Uh, out in the field, but but the issue we don't realize here that we don't take into consideration, most folks don't, is the fact that everything in nature is programmed to overpopulate the carrying capacity of the land. These hunting areas, these hunting concession areas, uh, you know, we, we heard several times talking about the fact that these areas are the outlying areas adjacent to national parks in most cases. They're the areas where wildlife, which is protected in national parks, are supposed to, as those populations grow and overcapacity, you know, reach a number where they need to move out into other areas, they move into these hunting concession areas. I live in Montana. We've had grizzly bears in our wilderness, the Bob Marshall Wilderness and Glacier National Park, and now uh, that population has exceeded the carrying capacity of that environment. They're now moving out hundreds of miles away into places we haven't seen them in over 100 years. That is a great story. And But people need to understand that the uh, hunting of animals is done under the pretense of science. There's a limited offtake that can be taken by of, of these animals. Um, and, and I give an analogy. People ask, well, why do we hunt these iconic species of animals, the lion, uh, these Argali sheep species, whatnot? And I liken it to uh, uh, the rat analogy. If you have a rat in your house, I think most of us would want to get rid of it one way or the other. And uh, so in that case, if you have a rat that's now worth, say, 50 or $100,000 U.S., you're not going to want to get rid of it. You want to grow more of it. Now, that's a simplified uh, analogy, but that's really what we see on the ground with creating value with wildlife resources all around the world. So, um, you know, hunting of those animals, as long as humans have walked on two feet, we've hunted. Uh, but now, as we have the seven or eight billion people on this planet and affecting wildlife habitats all over the world, then we have to start taking responsibility and being good stewards of the land and being a whole lot better neighbors to the rest of the creatures out there. Thank you, uh, Tom. I see that Yvonne was uh, appearing. I, maybe sh Do you want to make a statement, uh, Yvonne, before we move forward with some of the comments we received in the chat? Thanks, Diana. And basically, I have to leave very soon, but I, I really welcome all these different exchanges of views. And I, I think it's good that we open up this conversation to the to the to those who are participating right now uh, in, and listening to see what, what they think about it. Um, I think this is missing also in CITES. I think we have to, well, there's a very polarized environment about approaches to conservation. And I think that it's very important to be able to have these discussions because I think in this way we can learn from each other and look at different approaches and how they work. I never believe for anything that there's only one answer, that there's only one approach. I think that there are many approaches as long as they're duly in, within the regulations and that we know that we are not over exploiting um, and that the communities are fully involved. And in some of the comments that I've seen in the chat box now is talking about why, why some are upset about these hunting trophies also is that the, the, the money doesn't come back to the community. The government takes part of the money or takes all of the money. And that's a problem too. So there has to be some way of uh, managing how this is done so that the communities are the ones who benefit. But I'm really happy to hear this conversation. This has been my, I'm glad that we're moving out of the pandemic and even we have to do this online, 
we can have these conversations to look at different views and find different approaches and learn from each other. I think this is absolutely important to help with the polarization that we are, we are seeing, we saw during COP18, for example, because of different views uh, from different parties. But I think it's really good that they can hear uh, all the different uh, points of views and, uh, and come to learn again about how the different approaches are working in different countries. Thank you, Diana, and thanks to everyone. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Secretary General. Um, let me bring here one comment. We have uh, Paul-André Desjarges, who is a retired uh, ecologist who has been uh, uh, putting uh, various comments in the chat that are accessible to the panel. But um, he mentioned that, in his opinion, a major problem is that uh, with the CBNRM is that the time uh, the software operator and government takes their cut of the net profits, there is very little for the community, which is also referring to what the Secretary General was just mentioning. And so maybe you would have also something to say on that, uh, Maxi. And another comment that comes from uh, uh, somebody uh, uh, from Antoine Spielmann, sorry, um, who uh, says that only rich countries can afford uh, to ban uh, hunting. It costs the Canton of Geneva 1.8 million US dollars per year to manage its wildlife. Um, and we only have uh, 3,000 hectares here of forest. And he mentions that the Canton of Valais has banned uh, Ibex hunting for foreign hunters just because uh, one 10 minutes TV program showing a tourist killing uh, uh, an, 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 uh, uh, an Ibex. Um, by this ban, they are giving up close to 1 million US dollars yearly revenues to the, to the, for the canton. How can NGOs like uh, yours and hundreds work together in order to find common grounds beneficial to all of us and especially to the third uh, world countries uh, and fight the social media uh, uh, pictures? As showing hunters as criminals. So this is a very uh, an opinion, a very strong opinion. So, um, any comments uh, on those those two comments that we received on the chat? Over to you. So maybe I will give you the floor first, uh, Maxi. Okay. Um, thank you so much, and thanks for the question. Um, yes, I think um, from where I come from, that's a bit different because we have regulations that are very clear, and uh, for us. Um, the income from hunting goes to, to the community. So we don't have any middlemen and, and uh, profits that, um, uh, that, 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 you know, so it's accrued to the community 100% what is promised to the community. So unfortunately, um, uh, it is true that in some other countries that is not the case. And maybe that's something that we need to um, correct and move forward. But also, I would like to also just add that Yes, um, there's no perf there's, there's nothing that is perfect. There's a lot that needs to be worked on in, in the hunting industry, just like any other industry. And it's something that I think as people that provide services, whether it's government or NGOs or private sector, we all have to take our hands where there's gaps and loopholes within the hunting industry and making sure those benefits really, really accrue to those communities. So for, for Namibia and some other countries in Southern Africa, it's a bit different, but I can see from other countries, yes, there's those problems in, in Africa that we still need to address. Uh, so that's the question uh, that, I can, that, that I can respond to. But I also just want to quickly respond on one of the other questions um, around, um, for me, the biggest issue around um, you know the public and not understanding the issue of hunting or trophy hunting. It comes to me to the issue of just mutual respect in terms of you know uh, can you respect the views of, 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 of others. If we can have that uh, you know just that respect between us, then it would be easier to also listen. I found that there is too much uh, you know, being said from the other side and especially from the West telling us, you know, what is right for us. And we have not, and they have not, they, they don't have wildlife, most of them, ex except a few of them that I will listen to. But the rest, uh, it's a question of have no respect um, for others and especially African communities and telling them what to do. So I think if we have that respect, then we can sit around the table and talk about what is best for wildlife. And I'm sure we will listen to those ones that um, have respect for us. Thank you. Thank you, Maxi. Adam, any comments on those two remarks? 
Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. It's a, it's a tremendously complex activity. So we're, we're talking about, you know, trophy hunting, but but actually we're talking about, you know, which species, which population, which region, which country. And, you know, as Maxie said, there's an awful lot of different um, practices and an awful lot of different financial models, some of which work far better than others. Um, and I think, you know, the, the challenge is to make sure that that we don't, as says one of the, the papers of um, uh, referring to this is throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, if, if things need improving, then they must be improved. Uh, but if things are already working well, then then we need to respect that. I, I, I think the other the other question is down to the amount of money, which was mentioned in um, the second question. This is something I often see put about, and it's a, it's a, a false economic argument, really. And um, people often go, um, you know, hunting brings in only one percent of the GDP or 0.5 percent of the GDP of the country, therefore it can be removed. And you know, the analogy to that really is is here in the UK. Um, the UK fishing industry is is tiny, really, in terms of our GDP, and yet it it nearly derailed all kinds of things. It became a central pivot of Brexit. And I grew up in a fishing town and it's absolutely essential to the people that live in that area. And it's the same really with some of these hunting revenues. We can look upon it from, from a distance and look at these large numbers and, and, and dismiss them because they're only 0.0% of this or something else. But to the communities that derive that benefit, they are vital. And, and I think that that's really something that we need to to bear in mind. Um, we also need to look at the employment that's involved. Um, more people are employed in the, the hunting industry, for example, in Tanzania, which is a comparable sized country in terms of population to the UK than are employed in the UK fishing industry. Um, if Tanzania rightly looked upon Britain and our overfishing of our waters and started campaigning to have our fishing industry banned, I'm pretty sure that we'd have short shrift. And, and I think this well, they would get short shrift. And I think this really re re reflects back to what Max has just said about having some mutual respect. But a lot of that respect comes from understanding and from having the correct information in front of you, rather than the sort of simplistic narratives that are often pushed forward. Tom, anything you would like to add here? Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll echo some of those sentiments from the previous two speakers, but in my experiences in Zambia, working with the Nortons and Mikasa Safaris that we see in the film, and and people ask me a lot of times at, at screenings at film festivals, you know, well, you know, if somebody is able, if they get hunting quota, which they now do have a limited quota, I think of 35 animals, which entails maybe four hunters coming to the area over the course of six months of the safari hunting season there, uh, you know, a lion hunt is $80,000 US and people say, wow, that's a lot of money. Well, it is a lot of money, but it costs a lot of money to conduct that type of, of hunt. And so once these, the safari operator pays for all that expense, now that $80,000 has to go into not only the cost of, of hosting the hunter and the staff that they have, but also has to go into all the improvements and development that they've done, not only for their business, but also the things that they've committed to in the community. In the case of Mikasa Safaris, I think we're working on five classroom blocks now that have been built, uh, a clinic, a medical clinic, when there was only two medical clinics in an area that's the size, uh, it's larger than the Grand Canyon National Park or the state of Delaware here in the United States. It's an immense place. Uh, and so they have all these expenses and, and I kind of liken it to if you were to contract someone to build you a barn for $80,000, um, that barn, that $80,000 doesn't go into the contractor's pocket and he goes and sticks it in an offshore account in the Panama you know, area or some other thing like that. What happens is they spend all that money to build that barn. And when they get done, maybe there's a profit of 10 or $20,000. And that money, well, that doesn't go off into some offshore account. That goes into uh, the pay for their mortgage, for their home or their rents, the pays for their insurance, pays for the marketing from them to go out and, and continue working their business and selling uh, their operations. So I think people have to understand these, these folks that are doing these, these hunting operations are just like us. They're regular folks. They just have a passion for the outdoors, a passion for the people they work with, and they're just trying to do things are right. Now, there's always bad apples in every bushel, but the regardless is, is that we, we need to understand that these people are our last line of defense and the communities that they have partnered with are our last line of, of defense against the, the wholesale loss of wildlife habitat and the wildlife in it. So I think it's real important people understand this, this is about economics and, and it's very complex and uh, 
And I think that uh, when you see the social media posts where people are bantering around about 3% and, and you know, no money goes, well, I know in, in the Luano, the chief gets 5% of every trophy fee. There's a percentage that goes to the uh, community resource boards, which are the folks that actually hire the Game Scouts and pay for them. And then, of course, National Parks and Wildlife gets their share. And, and, uh, and I've seen their rangers on the ground working in the lower Luano. And it's, uh, they all work together in concert to make sure that we have to, to do a greater good. Thank you, Tom, for sharing this. So definitely uh, uh, more communication is needed uh, uh, on this particular topic. Um, I have a last question for you, but before that, I will turn again to Maxi um, because we are also getting closer to World Women's Day and, uh, and, and, and it's a topic that it's close to your heart uh, and, and, and women are really very present in this uh, in the film. Uh, con uh, so concerning the women's contribution and what was depicted in, in, the, in the film, what is there something uh, else that you would like to share uh, with us? Yeah, thank you, Alice. Yes, uh, I think one of the things that really touched me as part of the film was um, how, how long it actually took. First, I looked at it. How long did it took for these things to be translated in real impacts? And I think if I'm not mistaken and I stand to be corrected, it was two years. And so I, I looked at it and I thought, yes, it's because there were women involved. They're very committed. And I think um, when you look at conservation and some of the projects that you, that you are involved with, where you really empower women, where you make them part of the decision making, and because probably 80% of rural Africa women are, live very close to those natural resources and they work with natural resources. So once they are empowered, this is the differences and the impacts that you can see all around. In Namibia, we have just started working on the programs in the Northwest where I said that there's a lot of these um, conservation activities happening around wildlife. We have a group called Women Conservation and, and this group of women are indigenous communities, marginalized communities, but all women. And when you go into this and see the differences in terms of how conservation is in their lives, but also impacting the children's lives uh, and that's because women are, are empowered in those areas. So it doesn't matter whether it's conservation, whether it's any other little project that you have, please make sure that you involve women and you make a difference. So for me, that is the message of, of today on this Wildlife Day, World Wildlife Day, that can we try and make sure that we involve women in decision making, but also making sure that they are able to make certain decisions and we will see how our wildlife species can maybe flourish more than what we have now. So I think that is my message for, 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 for today in terms of women participation in these programs. Thank you very much, Maxi, for sharing this. Tom, I see here a lot of discussions on hunting, so certainly we will uh, uh, address it, this topic further in, uh, in other events we will, um, we will um, schedule later uh, this year. I wanted to um, to ask you: um, Are you working on a new film? Uh, is there something you you would like to share with us? Yeah, you know, I just want to hint a little bit about uh, what you and Maxie were talking about in women, and uh, it, it was interesting. I'll share a little story. My wife came over for one of the the shoots we did over there, and actually, it took me three and a half years to to complete uh, the production of the film. Of course, COVID uh, made it interesting for a while and it delayed us until uh, I think August, September of 2020 before we did the final filming. But when my wife was there, I remember she was in the back of the Land Cruiser with some Game Scouts and, and she asked one of the Game Scouts, so, so what do you think about having a woman chief? And the, the response was remarkable. And then that he said, you know, we love having a woman chief because if we have a man, all men do is they care about themselves. Whereas when we have a woman, he's there our mother and she cares about us. And I think that's really important. Uh, you know, we've been really blessed to, to be able to create some initiatives out of this project that have come around, you know, literally evolved organically. Uh, we're working on a women's empowerment initiative where uh, we have, uh, we've taken uh, wire snares and we have eight women working full-time at Makasa Safari, Safaris that are repurposing them into bracelets and, and folks can go to the Shepherds of Wildlife uh, website and you can purchase a bracelet and uh, and that money goes to pay for the salaries. We've also started to help out with a soft loan program that Mikasa does, which is a zero interest short term loans. And I'm now seeing little businesses pop up all over the area 
uh, and these women are very wise with their with their time and their money, and they're doing great things. And so, you know, there's some wonderful things that can come out of this that we can take into other parts of the world too. And so, people ask me, you know, well, what's the next project? And and so, our goal here is to give a voice to these rural indigenous communities. And rural indigenous to me means people that have lived on the land in the same place in a rural area for a long time. And so, those 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 communities exist all over the world. So, we're looking at projects in Indonesia with the exotic skin industry. We're looking at uh, Scotland, uh, you know, out in the rural areas there. We're looking even even in Montana on the Rocky Mountain front with ranchers there. And then the Tall Tent Indians in Northwestern British Columbia and their relationship with their wildlife resources. So these are all really important stories that the broader public needs to come to understand because we see that politicization of, of wildlife conservation. We see the things on social media and, and we just need to let the scientists, let science dictate the day when it comes to our management of wildlife and then uh, and make sure it's a win-win for everybody on the ground, especially those stakeholders that are responsible for the wildlife, which are our rural indigenous communities. Thank you, Tom. And we look forward to bring other documentaries to uh, discussions ongoing in international uh, Geneva. Um, Sophie, is there something you would like to add? Because I didn't turn to you uh, to cite this as Ivan has left. So feel free to, to intervene if there is something you would like uh, to add. Otherwise, I will turn to each of you for a, a last word uh, or a, mess a specific message uh, you have uh, for World uh, Wildlife Day. And uh, I will um, do you, uh, you, Tom, you will uh, be the last. I will start by uh, Adam and then move to Maxi and then we I will ask Tom. Okay, well, I guess, uh, you know, it's World Wildlife Day and I've I've been obsessed with wildlife for uh, as long as I've been able to be uh, aware of anything around me. Um, but, you know, what I've come to realise over over the past sort of 20 years or so is that if, if you want wildlife to thrive, then people have to thrive as well. And that's what's often forgotten. So on World Wildlife Day, you know, let's think about, about people as well and about how we can bring everyone along uh, and end up with a world that, that we want rather than the world that it looks like we might be heading towards. Thank you, Adam. Maxi? Yeah, thank you so much. I think I have said already so much about World Wildlife, World Wildlife Day, but I think my, my message um, is that um, let's put, I think Adam has said, can we put also people in the center of whatever we are doing with wildlife because that is, you know, it's it, their core to whatever we do. And so our communities um, are very key. Our indigenous people are very key. Our marginalized people are very key. So think about when you make decisions, when you're planning, think about these people first and uh, try and include them in all aspects of your decision making. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maxi, for being with us. Tom, over to you. And I'll, I'll echo what Maxi just said. I mean, you know, here in the Western modern world, we have to realize that our decisions do have downstream effects. They can be either very positive or they can be very negative. And uh, we need to just uh, be willing to listen to these other folks and, uh, and not pass judgment so quickly and be open to some of these ideas. If you don't understand wildlife conservation or what's going on, whether it be hunting or, or any of the other topics we've talked about, then do the research, you know, look into these things. Uh, you obviously love to have you watch my film. If folks want to go to killingtheshepherd.com, they can watch the feature length uh, version of the film, which ran all over in film festivals around the world. And uh, but I'd like to thank everybody who's participated in the panel, and of course, CITES and the Secretary General for for being a part of this, because this is so critical to making sure that you know we leave this planet better than the way we found it. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, indeed, the film um, is available on our website, and we will continue uh, sharing uh, um, uh, the web page of this event. Uh, um, and some of the key messages that came out and includes inclusively some links. Um, to publications or to videos or other uh, material that could be useful to better explain uh, what you try to explain with your words today. Just bring to your attention so that, as it was mentioned by the Secretary General, uh, World, Wildlife Day, World Wildlife Day is officially celebrated on 3rd of March, 
which is next Thursday, that you will find a lot of interesting resources on World Wildlife Day uh, official website. And for who is based uh, in our area, uh, in Switzerland, Geneva, we are organizing a few other events, but also for everything is live, so everybody is, uh, is um, invited to join. Uh, there are two uh, more uh, film uh, screenings and debates coming up. And there is, of course, the, the official celebration held by the CITES Secretariat on the 3rd of March at 2 p.m. So we invite you to, to join these events if you're interested by those topics. And uh, we'll certainly uh, continue the discussions uh, on some of the topics that were addressed here today, as we see that um, there was a, a, a a uh, uh, really uh, long debate uh, on the chat uh, on uh, on these issues. So we want we here to thank uh, the the panelists that join us uh, uh, virtually for this event today, and you also uh, the attendees who have uh, stayed with us until now, who has who is watching this video on on uh, social networks and uh, who will be watching it uh, later. Um, and so, um, uh, happy World Wildlife Day and stay tuned for uh, celebrating the day uh, with the other events that are scheduled. Thank you all for joining us today.